let's get down to business. Okay, question one reads, which of the following is an example of the application of chemistry in a home? Now, this question is specific. So you have to be uh, taking uh, note of the keywords, okay? So the keyword here, there is this one, application of chemistry in a home. Now, chemistry is applicable in almost everything that we do in life, but this particular situation, they want the application of chemistry in a home. So basically, we want to look at the things that we do in a home and which ones are chemistry. So basically, anything that involves uh, reactions, anything that involves chemical-like is found in the home. Okay, let's look at the choices that we have. A, we have the use of amplifiers in the radio. B, we have the use of cosmetics. C, we have production of ammonia in the harbor process. And option D, we have industrial production of alcohol. Now, let's start from D. D cannot be the answer because even in the beginning, we have said industrial production. So this one is an industrial, uh, an industrial application. Let's go to C. Now, production of ammonia in the harbor process, that is also an industrial production where ammonia is produced in the large quantities. So that one is out. Now, let's look at the use of cosmetics. So the use of cosmetics, we are talking about things like lotions, soaps, and uh, so on and so forth. Things that we tend to use in, the, in, in our homes, like things for our body, lotion for our bodies, uh, chemicals for the hair, uh, and, and, and other chemicals. So those, they will fall under cosmetics. So definitely B was the correct answer here. Now, why is A not the correct answer? The use of amplifiers in a radio. Wow, this is more of physics than chemistry. So the correct answer for A1 is B. Let's go to question two. The best apparatus that is used to accurately measure a required fixed volume of a reagent during titration is... Now, let's look at the choices that we have. So choice A, this is a, a, a measuring a, 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 some sort of a beaker, okay? So this one, it does not give specific volumes, okay? Then B, this is a pipette. As you can see, most of the pipettes, they are even uh, written 25 centimeter cubic, meaning this one can only measure 25 centimeter cubic. So this is accurately the required volume. So whenever you, you need to measure an exact amount of volume during a titration, we use what we call a pipette. So B is a pipette. Then C, this is just another type of a measuring cylinder. Then D, this one is a burette. So a burette uh, is, uh, is, is used when titrating. That is where we put mostly uh, the, the solution whose concentration is known. So the best answer also in here is B. From my explanation, B is a pipette. And a pipette is mostly used when you are trying to measure an exact volume during a titration. Okay, we proceed. Question three. The question reads, the best method to separate a mixture of sand and diesel is, now let's look at the choices. So choice A is decantation. Now, in order for us to choose, we need to be understanding what each of these options means. So decantation, is simply a method that is used to separate liquids and solids in a scenario where a liquid can be poured out, leaving the solid into a containing vessel. For example, a stone and uh, water. We can gently pour out the water, leaving the stone into the container. So that is a, uh, an example scenario where we use decantation. So meaning sand cannot work because as you are pouring, sand can also come out together with a the diesel, okay. Then distillation, uh, this one is a general process which can be categorized into two. We have what we call fractional distillation and we have what we call simple distillation. So fractional distillation is used to separate miscible liquids that have got different boiling points. For example, water and ethanol. Then simple distillation is used uh, to, uh, uh, simple distillation is used uh, to separate uh, substances that can vaporize and be condensed back into a liquid. Okay, let's look at C. So C is evaporation. So usually this one is used to separate 
water from a solution. Okay, for example, a salt solution, we can remove the water there, leaving the salt crystals on their own, or even a sugar solution. Let's look at filtration. So filtration, this is the one which usually we can use to separate a mixture of the liquid and smaller solids. For example, the sand and the diesel. Diesel is in liquid form and the sand is in solid form. So the sand is going to be trapped on the filter paper and it will be called the residues. Then the diesel will pass through as a filtrate, which will be collected in a beaker or any receiving vessel. Okay, so the best answer that we had for question three is D. Okay, let's proceed to question four. Question four is identify an inert gas from the diagrams below. Okay, so diagram A, this one, as you can see, it represents what we call uh, a diatomic gas because there are two atoms. This is an atom and that is an atom. So this one represents a diatomic gas. Then B, this one represents what we are calling a mixture. So B represents what we are calling a mixture because you can see there are two different types of atoms in here and they are not chemically combined. So this is definitely a mixture. Then we look at this one. This one is specific. It's a monoatomic gas, okay? It is specific. It's monoatomic and there is no combination of anything else. So this one is a monoatomic gas. Then uh, D, this one is a compound because you can see the two atoms, they are actually chemically combined, okay? So now the question reads, identify an inert gas. So an inert gas is uh, definitely C because this one is the only one which showed a monoatomic gas, okay? We can proceed to question five. The following equation is incomplete. Now, they are saying two lithium hydroxide plus sulfuric acid is equals to X. Now, here we need to have our basic knowledge. We need to have our basic knowledge which says when you add an acid, so when you add an acid, so I'm just trying to summarize an equation here, an acid plus a base, so this B will be for a base, it is going to give us what we call a sort, okay? A sort. So we're going to have a sort plus water. So a sort plus water. So this one is water. That is the general equation uh, for the reaction between. So now we are saying every time lithium hydroxide or hydroxide are bases, they are alkalis to be specific then this H2SO4 is an acid. So acid plus base will always give us a salt and water. So now, how do we know? We get the metal part here, the metal part of the base plus the last part of the acid. They tend to combine together. That is what forms a salt. Then the remaining part here, the OH and the H2 is what is going to give us the water. So if we get the lithium, and the sulfate there, so we we'll discover to say this is L I there, and lithium has got a balance of one. Then the sulfate S O uh, four, uh, this definitely has a balance of two. So when we swap these two here, we are going to find the formula L I uh, two S O. Uh, four. So this is the name of the salt that we're going to form. Then this one will be plus the water, which is H2O. Uh, so this is what we expect. So X, we expect that it is going to be this one. Okay, so let's check on the choices if we have anything that looks like this. Okay, and on, also always remember to balance up the equation. So since there's two lithium this side, even this lithium is two. There is two hydrogen this side. Then let's check also here, meaning on water, we are supposed to add a two so that the hydrogens we have here is two plus the two here, which is four. So even here, there are four. Then the oxygens here, we have four oxygen plus this oxygen that is there, making it six. 
even on the product side here, we are also having two oxygen plus four, which is six. So this is balanced. So let's check LI, option A is Li2SO4 plus two. So this one is definitely our answer according to our analysis. Okay, so we can uh, proceed. I think there is no any other answer here. So we can proceed. We go to question six, which reads, which of the following molecules has a triple bond? Which of the following molecules has a triple bond? Now, uh, chlorine, uh, two chlorines, that is uh, two chlorines, they are simply going to be something like Cl, Cl, and then this one, it lacks one. So they are going to share just one. So it is going to just be like that because one, uh, one dash represents a bond. This one represents a bond, which represents two electrons. So only two electrons are shared here, okay? So we have analyzed A doesn't have a triple bond. Let's go to B, which is carbon dioxide. So we are going to have a carbon here, then an oxygen there, and an oxygen there. So meaning uh, oxygen, uh, uh, this one carbon here has got a valence of four, meaning it requires four more. So it is going to share, uh, it is going to share for this side. So it is going to have two, and four electrons, even this side it will be two and four electrons. Why? Because one bond represents two electrons. So this is two, four, two, four. So that when you add this four plus this four, this one becomes stable with eight. Then oxygen also is sharing four plus this other two that is there, making it eight. So this one is stable. So having tested this one, we know that it can't be the answer. Now, nitrogen, is one weird guy so nitrogen this one is possible that it can have a triple bond so it is going to be like this and then uh it will have something like this so this one will be two four six then plus the two here and the two so it is going to have something like that okay so something like that even here it has something like this so when you check it is now balanced so nitrogen is definitely our answer, which is C. Let's check our equation uh, below, uh, question seven. The question reads, the diagram below shows the preparation of a sort. The diagram below shows the preparation of a sort. So here, let's look at the sorts that we have. So we have silver nitrate reacting sodium chloride so these are both in aquas. So these are two soluble salts that are reacting to produce an insoluble salt and a soluble salt. So this type of a reaction is what we call a double decomposition. So this one will be called a double decomposition. So a double decomposition is a type of a reaction in which two soluble salts are used to prepare an insoluble salt. And in the process, one, uh, one, of, one of the salts produced is also soluble. Okay, so now how, how does it happen? So these two salts, as they are reacting, they tend to exchange their last parts. So these last parts will be exchanged. So this was uh, silver nitrate. When you go this side, it will be silver chloride because the chlorine will cross over. Then the nitrate will cross, over, will cross over to there, which becomes sodium nitrate. So definitely this one is called a double decomposition or a precipitation reaction. Okay, having analyzed that, let's check what our question says. It says, which of the following gives the correct description of the equation? So for the salt, they've given us silver chloride, and they are telling us that this is an insoluble salt, which is true. Then the method of separation here, it's definitely filtration because we have a solid and we are, so we have uh, so we have a solid and we have uh, a solution. So we have a solution and a solid. So filtration is not going to work. Sorry. So let's go to uh, this one. Sodium nitrate. Yes, it is a soluble salt. Now, how can it be separated from uh, this uh, guy here? Okay, we put that on question mark. Okay, we put it on question mark. Then we go to silver chloride. So silver chloride is not soluble. So definitely C and, uh, and D are not correct because silver chloride is insoluble 
and sodium nitrate is soluble. So these two are not answers. So let's check on, uh, on these two answers between A and B. So now we know that these two, uh, so how do you separate uh, an insoluble salt from a soluble salt? I think the best thing here is the filtration. So I think the best answer that we'll go for here is the A. Okay, so we proceed. Question eight, the question reads, what mass of copper two oxide would react completely with 500 centimeters cubic of a 0 0.5 uh, molar dilute sulfuric acid? Okay, so we are looking for mass here. Now, looking at the kind of data that they've given us, this one which we have been given here, this one is the volume. And this one that we have been given here, it's the concentration. So the only way out here is to use the formula which says concentration is equals to, okay, number of moles over volume. This is the formula that is going to help us here. Now, in order for us to use this, uh, this formula, we have the concentration here and we have the volume here. So now, since we have this volume, the first thing we have to make sure is that all the volumes, they are supposed to be in decimeter cubic. So in order to convert, we are just going to divide this one by a thousand. So this one divided by a thousand because uh, 1000 centimeter cubic is equal to one decimeter. That's why we are dividing by a thousand. So dividing that one by a thousand, we are definitely going to have a concentration of about 0 0.5. So we're going to have our 0 0.5 decimeter cubic. So 0 0.5 decimeter cubic. Okay, that's what we have. Now, using this one, we are now going to just say, okay, in this case, it implies that number of moles is equals to 0 0.5, which is concentration, 0 0.5 decimeter cubic multiplying with uh, the, uh, so the, zero, the, the 0 0.5 decimeter cubic multiplying with the 0 0.5. And we expect that our answer here, number of moles will definitely be 0 0.5. 0.25 moles. So we have 0 0.25 moles. Then now from here, we are going to use the formula which says number of moles is equals to mass over molar mass. So mass over molar mass. That is what you're going to use. Now we can easily find the molar mass from this because they've said copper two oxide. So we can easily make a formula for copper two oxide. Now copper has got a valence of, okay, so we do Cu with a valence of two, then oxygen also with a valence of two. So when we swap these ones down here, we are still going to have Cu two here down, then O, we also have a two down here. So because these can be canceled out, we cancel out, we cancel out, this means that our formula is going to be C U O. So now here we can easily add down. So copper has got about 64 grams per mole. So we add plus the one for oxygen. So oxygen is 16. So now in chemistry, you can even use a calculator. So you can easily add uh, 16 plus 64. So let's do that on the calculator. So that is 64 plus 16. This one is going to give us 80 grams per mole. So our answer here is 80 grams per mole. So 80 grams per mole. Okay. So now having found that, we know that to find the mass here, we are going to multiply the number of moles multiplied by the molar mass and the number of moles is 0 0.25. So multiplying this one by 0 0.25, so we multiply by 0 0.25. And this one is going to give us an answer of about, so let's do that on the calculator. So we multiply uh, the 80 grams per mole, 80 multiplied by 
0 0.25 and we have our 20 grams. So our answer here is 20 grams. And that is our final answer. Then we just have to counter check if we have such a thing on the answers and it corresponds with the D. Okay, so uh, let's go to uh, let's go to uh, let's go to question nine. Question nine reads. Question nine reads. The table below shows some transition elements and their uses. Which one is the correct use in the contact and the harbor process? So now the first thing that you need to know is that the harbor process. This is the industrial production of ammonia and iron is used as a catalyst, okay? So uh, having, uh, having known this one, we should also ask ourselves, what is the contact process? Now in the contact process, uh, the contact process, uh, it's also a process in, uh, the, the contact process is the current method of producing sulfuric acid. Eh? So now uh, the, 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 the one that is used here, uh, platinum was initially used as a catalyst for this reaction. However, it is uh, susceptible to reacting with the arsenic impurities in the sulfur feedback. So instead, they use vanadium. So we are saying here we use vanadium. Then in the uh, harbor process, we use iron. So definitely here, these are just remembering questions. So you have to know that the contact process, this one is the industrial preparation of whom? sulfuric acid. And the catalyst that is used is the vanadium. Then uh, harbor process is the industrial preparation of ammonia, and the catalyst used here is the iron. Okay, then let's look at question 10. So which of the arrangements below is suitable for collecting a gas uh, that is denser than air? Okay, a gas that is denser than air. So now for a gas that is uh, denser than air, it should be collected by what we call downward displacement of air. So it should be collected by what we call downward displacement of air. So I think in the next segment, I'll talk more about question 10 so that I'll be able to explain what each of these terms is supposed to mean. Okay, so we'll leave this one hanging just a bit. There's something that I need to explain. Okay, so question 11, this one, it reads, the relative formula mass for calcium hydrogen carbonate is, now these are simple questions, calcium hydrogen carbonate. So here, we just start dealing with it right here. So carbon uh, here, we have got three times two, which is six. So we have got about six multiplied by the mass number of oxygen is 16. So there we can find that one. Then we go to carbon as well. So how many carbons do we have? We have only about two carbons. So two multiplied by uh, 12, okay? We are also supposed to find the total there. Then we go to hydrogen. So hydrogen here, we only have two and hydrogen is one. So this is two multiplied by the mass number, which is one. Then finally, we have our calcium here, which is also just one multiplied by 40. So one multiplied by 40. So let's just fill in the answers there and you can quickly do this with a calculator. That is the beauty of chemistry. So 16 times six, I'm pretty sure this one is going to give us, uh, let's check, check, confirm with a calculator. 16 times six, 16 multiplied by six, just uh, 16 multiplied by six, that is 96, okay? So here, we are going to find that it is 96 grams per mole. Then this one, two times 12, this one will give us 24, okay? Then this one is going to give us just zero two. Then this one will give us 40. So what do we do? We now add the total for everything because we are finding relative molecular mass. So we add 96 plus, 24 plus 2 plus 40. And we have our 162. So 162 is our 
answer. So let's check on the choices. Do we have 162? Okay, there our answer is D. Okay, question 12. The question reads, which of the following statements explains why magnesium, calcium, and barium are placed in group two of the periodic table? Okay, so now remember, uh, a periodic table is simply an arrangement, a tabular arrangement of uh, uh, elements according to their increasing proton numbers. Okay, so now, these, they were placed in groups and periods based on their physical and chemical properties. Okay, now let's check out. So group two elements, they all have two electrons in the outermost shell, which is true. They form basic oxides that are soluble in water. We can put that one in question mark. Their outermost electrons are lost when they react with nonmetals. Okay, uh, which of the following statement explains why magnesium is placed in group two. So the reason why it is placed in group two, the other things might make sense, but the reason is because the electro, the valence electrons is two. Valence electrons is simply the number of electrons in the outermost shell. This is why uh, A is our best answer. Question 13. This one reads, how many molecules are found in six Point, uh, so 6.0 decimeter cubic of carbon dioxide at RTP. So now uh, here we are going to say one more. There are two things that we can use here. So there are how many molecules, okay? Now we know that one more, okay? One more, this one is equals to, so one more is equals to the Avogadro's constant, which is six point zero uh two others they might add the three multiplied by 10 to the power 23 molecules so just one more will give us that then we also know that one more of any gas at rtp is also equivalent to uh 24 decimeter cubed so we are going to use these two facts here, they're going to help us to deal with what we have. So we know that one more is equal to 24 decimeter. Then also the same one more is equal to 6.02 times 24 to the power, at the time, uh, times 10 to the power 23. So what we can easily do here is we can easily say, okay, uh, here we have our 24. We equate it directly to the Avogadro's constant, which is 6. Uh, point zero, uh, point zero 0.02 times uh, times 10 to the power 23. We equate it like this. Then now we're going to ask ourselves, how about six decimeter cubic will be equal to what? So this is decimeter cubic. It's a volume, decimeter cubic. Even this six also point zero, it's also in decimeter cubic, which will be equal to x so when we make our equation here we are supposed to cross multiply here so we can uh just go to the calculator and do that one so we're going to have 24x being equal to so the six uh the six point uh the six point zero three so let me try just to do this one six point uh so six point zero two six point zero two multiplied by 10 and uh, to the power 23, okay, to the power 23, this is being multiplied by 6, okay? So when you multiply this one by 6, we are going to actually divide it. So we have something like 3.61, uh, 3.61, uh, 3.612 times 10 to the power 24, then we divide this one by 24. Okay, so we have got something like 1.5 times 10 to the power 23. So x, make sure that your calculator is properly set. x will be equal to uh, 1.5 times 10 to the power 23. So this is the number of particles. Then we are going to check, do we have one? 0.5 times 10 to the power 23, and we have our answer right there. 
Okay. A14, which of the following is an alloy? Now we just need to be over ruling, uh, overruling these things. Rust is simply a brown substance that is formed when iron reacts with the uh, oxygen in moisture conditions. So it can be an alloy. Then silver, silver is definitely a pure metal, okay? Tungsten is also a pure metal. So our best here is bronze. So bronze is definitely um, an alloy. Now an alloy is a mixture of two or two or more metals, or even in rare cases, some metals. So the purpose of all, uh, alloying, mixing metals together is to improve their strength and other qualities. Okay, A15, the question reads, so A15, the question reads, halogens are useful elements, but also cause harm to the environment. Halogens are useful elements, but also cause harm to the environment. Which of the following is a true danger of halogens? So we rule, we, this one is not true. They don't cause HIV and AIDS. They are used to treat wounds or release. So this one is not a dangerous thing. Treating wounds is not a dangerous thing. So they all release harmful radiations. No, they don't release radiations. The only danger they pose in form of the tetrachloromethanes uh, or something, that's when they tend to contribute to the depletion of the ozone layer. So the best answer here is B. Which of the following is not? So we are emphasizing only not. And that is how we can best find our answer. Okay, we go to question 19. The compound represented below is, so you just check it out. So we've got uh, carbon here and carbon here. So definitely you can make, that is a C2. Then we've got hydrogen here, one, two, three, four. So we've got H4. So definitely you can recognize this because it corresponds to the formula, general formula CNH, the CNH, then two, N. Then because it has got two, so two means F. So meaning this is the general formula for alkenes, meaning this one is ethene. So this one is ethene. Why? Because if I put a two there and a two there, it will give me exactly this one. So this one, I know now it's an ethene, of which it is A. So someone might be wondering, why not ethanol? Ethanol always has an OH somewhere. Why not ethane? Ethan should have conformed to the general formula CN H uh, 2N plus 2. So unless if we had 6 at the end, then it would have been an ethan. So the best answer in this case is A. Okay. What is the name of the compound below? So the compound below, we first of all have to identify this uh, this bond here, okay? So this bond here, it looks like, uh, anyway, whatever you call it, this is uh, an ester linkage. This is an ester linkage. So definitely, if we know that this is an ester linkage, we know that this whole compound is definitely an ester, okay? This one is definitely an ester. Now, how do we name esters? How do we name esters? So esters, you just go to the name of the acid, so to the name of the acid, you remove the oic part and then add YL. So you remove, for example, if you have, in this case, it was ethanoic. So ether, uh, ethanoic, like this, ethanoic acid, okay? Then you just have to remove uh, this one, all of it, you remove it here, then you add Y. L, this is where the ether comes from. Then from the name of the alcohol, uh, so from the name of the alcohol, you just have to remove the last part and add OAT. This is how come this one becomes ether, ethanol et as the best answer. So you just remove uh, here uh, on the, uh, on the uh, here, because ethanol will always, for example, this one, ethanol, will be like this. 
So let me just try to explain this one again so that people can get it. Okay, so now I said to an acid because it will be like ethanoic. So you just remove the, from A here, you just get the first three letters, the F part, the F, the, the prefix. So just get the prefix, then to the prefix, add YL. Then to the alcohol part, because an ester is a compound formed when an alcohol and a carboxylic acid react, they join together with the expulsion of a water molecule. That's why it is a condensation polymer. So in water molecule, go meaning the acid and the alcohol, they combine together. Now, when they combine together, how do you come up with the name? So from the acid part, you have to just get the prefix, which is uh, the prefix, we know the, the, the 10 prefixes in organic chemistry. So you just get the prefix, then you from the prefix, you add Y, L, then to the ethanol part there, you just have to remove the L, just remove the L and add A, uh, T, E. Now, remember, when you add this, plus this what we had at first, it gives us the name ether, ethanoid. Therefore, our answer is this one. Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe to our channel and we'll be solving a lot of questions. We just want to uh, contribute to your personal development and your success.